Okay, welcome to the Nudge monthly meeting for February. So um, for those who have been to these meetings before, we follow a, you know, a reasonably uh, predictable and very interactive um, format and schedule. So we have a, a reasonably large turnout uh, today. So I think um, for for speaking up, maybe use the raise hand icon under under reactions. It's not obvious. Um, yeah, you should be able to hit the, the reactions button and, and raise a hand and um, that, that way we can kind of you know, manage how many people are speaking at once. That said, please do you know, raise a hand and uh, and contribute. Um, we're, we also chat sort of in the in the chat and in the, um, the nurse users Slack at the same time. You can keep conversation going there uh, after the meeting as well. So we'll follow our, our usual agenda pattern with a, a one minor uh, addition today. So we'll, we start out with uh, a win of the month and today I learned and these are opportunities to you know, talk about uh, things that have gone well and, and things that either haven't gone well or that you've uh, you know stumbled across that are interesting and beneficial to other nurse users. Um, we have uh, Lippi Gupta from Nurse Care who's going to talk a little bit about the user community survey that is uh, in flight at the moment. Yeah, a number of people have filled it out. Um, we have a, a handful of announcements and calls for participation, and there's also an opportunity for if there's uh, an event that you know of that other nurse users might be interested in um, to you know, let people know about it. Uh, and then we'll go into our topic of the day, which is going to be Corey's retirement. So uh, Rebecca from Nurse UAG is here, and she'll give us a bit of an overview of the plans for Corey's retirement coming up yeah, fairly soon. So let's kick things off with win of the month. So the aim of this segment is an opportunity to show off an achievement or shout out somebody else's achievement that you know of. Uh, and these can be big or small, um, have, you know, having a paper accepted somewhere, solving a bug. And you know, it's, uh, it's always interesting to hear how, yeah, how you solved it. Um, and that I think is uh, you know, it's, it's good tips for other users as well. Um, you may have uh, have either made or know of um, uh, you know, a significant scientific achievement, uh, might be a, a candidate for one of the science highlights that we present to uh, DOE uh, fairly, fairly frequently, uh, or even a, a high impact scientific achievement award or an innovative use of high performance computing award. Would anybody like to kick us off? Got a, a win of the month to to show off or shout out. Kevin. I don't have anything as fancy as, uh, you know, the word or anything, but um, last week I got the first test for stream triggered communication working. So now I have something that's running and working and getting cool results and I get to test it even more and give, I have something to actually present at Siam in next week, no, two weeks. Yes. So it was a pretty big win for me. So this is, this is interesting. Stream. Stream triggered. Stream triggered communication. Uh, this is a, a different model to MPI or this is a model within MPI? Uh, so the various vendors are potentially building their own versions now. The one I tested as the code is stable and sitting is NVIDIA's ACX, which is a library that sits on top of an MPI and essentially uh, maintains and manages a thread that puts a little trigger into the stream. And when you reach that point in the stream, the thread then takes over and makes your MPI call at the appropriate point in time. So it's, it's probably not going to be the final state, it's sort of the proof of concept, but that one's up and running. And it's since it's fairly stable, I can try it out very easily on lots of different things. And hopefully that's next week's work. So this is interesting. So then as a as a um, usage model, um, does the application poll the stream occasionally? Or does it just is it for applications that are you know, reading a constant stream of input and they you know, block until they've got the next 
while the current implementation is primarily focused on GPUs, so it's a that's literally a CUDA stream. So just okay. add in and let the CUDA scheduler and everything handle it. Uh, the general model is so that it's anything that can be represented as a stream. So a CPU stream object that I'm not sure is very well clarified at this point yet, but something like that could also be used to control it and manage it where the user essentially fires it and forgets it, or you have a little bit of control over you know where you're at and, and handling of it as you go. Uh, but that that's all in progress and fun stuff a lot. Yeah, so it's almost like a channels model of um, communication of mm -hmm. CUDA streams. Nice. Yep, something like that. Yeah, be good to see that. Uh, yeah, get uh, get take up and see. Ooh, that thanks, Paul. Use. I think I've seen this one. One of the yeah. Ah. There's a, a link in the chat. Paul's put put a, a link to a, a relevant paper. So it'll be good to see. And I see the PDF is purple, which means I've clicked on it before. Which is this is one of the ones I looked at when yep. I first started exploring. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Paul. So I think I've got something now for today. I learned as well, <laughs> which is at least a, or a begun to learn about uh, stream triggered computing. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. That's 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 really interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, anybody else got something they'd like to shout out? We actually have uh, uh, some extra things in the agenda today, so I might move on to the flip side of the coin of today I learned. Um, and uh, I guess the, yeah, the, the charge question for this segment is what surprised you that might benefit other users to hear about? Um, you know, and, and you know, might help with our documentation, for instance, as well. Um, so this is, you know, not everything works the first shot. In fact, very few things do. Uh, and in the process of, uh, you know, doing research and, and achieving something, you know, tend to learn a lot. Uh, and the, you know, the goal here is to actually you know, talk about those things that they, they, they might not have worked, but that doesn't mean they're a failure. That means they're something that, you know, we can learn from that potentially each other can benefit from as well. But it doesn't even have to be something that you got stuck on that, that can be something that you stumbled across that was, yeah, uh, yeah, this is this is an interesting topic to read more about that other, other users might be interested in. Uh, for instance, uh, stream triggered computing, which was more or less completely off my radar until Kevin talked about it just now. Yeah, I have to say, I'm, I'm looking forward to yeah, looking through that paper. Do we have a, something interesting to share? Maybe I can share a short one just to get things started. I, sure. I, I ran into this when I was trying to uh, debug preemptible jobs. And um, I, I learned that, that there's a flag, so I meant this flag time min, um, which to me, I sort of naively assumed meant this is the minimum amount of time I want the job to run. Um, yep. The minimum amount of time I can tolerate having the job run. Um, but what it actually means to slurm is this is how short you want your job to be. So if I asked for a time in of 10 minutes and it could fit in 10 minutes, it would only give me 10 minutes and nothing else. It wouldn't keep going um, and keep submitting it yeah. afterwards. It would just say, oh, you got your time in was 10 minutes. You got your 10 minutes, you're done. So I was pretty confused by what it was doing for a while <laughs> until I actually went and read the documentation. So um, today I learned that um, it means slurm's time in, not my minimum time. Right, so I might have just learned something as well because my interpretation of time min was that Slurm just looked for the first slot that was at least 10 minutes long. Right, that's uh, what I was thinking. Like that's the minimum that you want and instead it truncates your job to 10 minutes. Right, so. Hmm. So have you, have you seen times when you got longer than the time min? in the schedule because I wonder if this is related to how busy the system is as well. But for the, so 
I, I have in the preempt queue. So in the preempt queue, you, you say how much time you want. I mean, I didn't use the time in, but but then you can, uh, you know, say I need, you know, five hours and it yeah. gives me two and a half hours because they preempted me at two and a half, but not at the two minute, at the two limit. Right. Yep. So yeah, if you've got kind of a flexible job that can keep on running until it gets stopped, that's kind of a good option. I think we, we require the time min flag if you've run out of time and you're using the overrun queue. Okay, good. Uh, what do you call it? Good reason to, to dig into um, a checkpoint restart and other options like that. Thanks, Lisa. That's a good tip. Um, Does anybody else have a, a lesson learned they'd like to share? If nothing's jumping out, then we might uh, move along to talk a little bit about our uh, user community of practice and the community survey. Um, uh, Libby, would you like to Tell us some more about this. Yes, I would be happy to. I think um, you can actually skip this. I think something went wrong in the, yeah, there we go. Okay, great. Um, okay, well, let me introduce myself. My name is Lippy. Um, I am actually a postdoc at NERSC, but I started out as a user. Um, so I uh, was using uh, NERSC resources to do um, uh, my thesis uh, work when I was in graduate school. Um, and that's how I learned about NERSC and ended up applying for a postdoc. So um, if any of you are in that boat and are interested in learning about the postdoc uh, opportunities at NERSC, I would be happy to talk about that. Um, but also because I was a user, I um, have been really interested in user engagement now that I'm part of NERSC. Um, and currently we're in the process of wanting to create a really um, active community, um, in particular a community of practice. And so I think uh, at last month's meeting, uh, Rebecca uh, told you a little bit about what is a community of practice. Um, and it requires a couple things. First of all, it requires a shared domain of interest. So um, likely you are a nurse user, but also now hopefully interested in research computing and high performance computing. Um, for the purpose of doing science. So uh, many of us share that domain of interest. Um, that's how I pivoted from, I was doing my PhD in physics and now I'm at NERSC learning about high-performance computing and not doing quite as much physics um, because you know I, I learned, I, I became interested in that. Um, there's also an actively cultivated and maintained sense of community. So I think the key word here is really active. We, we have to be much more, um, uh, involved in how we're not only just cultivating this community, but also maintaining it. So having different programs and events that um, are uh, taking place within the community so that people can can practice that shared domain of interest, can, per can participate in it. Um, and exactly the last thing, active practice of the shared domain of interest. So that community is, is involved with uh, creating or collaborating in some way. Uh, we're sharing information and this is happening often um, and in various forms. Um, and so we're in the process now of creating that user community of practice. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so um, the one of the things that Rebecca had shared is that we are looking for a lot of community feedback. We have a lot of ideas. Um, many of us were nurse users. I was a nurse user. I have a lot of ideas about if this if these things had been available to me when I was just just a user. <laughs> um, you know, my experience at nurse, my ability to do science, my ability to use resources would have been, um, you know, better or different in some way. And so we want people who are currently in that position to give us feedback about a lot of different things. We, you know, we're we're wanting to hear about, you know, what what might a user community look like to you? What do you think might be missing from your current user experience? Um, what kinds of trainings and programs would help you feel like you're actively 
participating in this community of practice. And so one way we want to collect this information is through focus groups. Um, the idea being we want to gather people who are interested in talking to us um, over Zoom. Um, small groups to discuss with us, you know, what are your ideas? What are your challenges? What are the reasons that, you know, this kind of involvement would be not helpful maybe to you or, you know, what are things that could be really helpful to you? Um, and so it'll be an opportunity to discuss things with us um, directly. And, um, but we, we also want to just collect some feedback that doesn't require participation in one of these focus groups. You could um, participate in our survey um, part of that survey is letting us know if you want to participate in a focus group, if you'd like to talk to us um, in one of these groups, but we're also collecting a lot of really important information in the survey that you can provide, even if you don't have time or want to participate in a focus group. Um, so if you go to the next slide, we really need you to make this happen, and we're going to do kind of a, an in-class exercise. We don't want to ask people to spend time outside of this meeting to to do this because that we know that sometimes that's a barrier to participate so steve has kindly allowed us to take a couple minutes here during this meeting for everybody to go into um, this survey and complete it most of it is something that you can just provide a yes or no answer to there are spaces in there to fill in some information if you want to um, there aren't any like paragraphs of information requested and it's also a great place to let us know if you're interested in a focus group. So um, everybody go ahead and um, you can use the QR code, you can use the link that Rebecca is putting in chat. And we're just gonna let you fill that out for a couple of minutes so that you don't have to worry about it later. Um, and we can hopefully get a ton of feedback uh, right now. Um, I'm also happy to answer any questions that people have either about the survey or about, um, user community engagement or anything like that um or about being a postdoc at nurse whatever um but i will i will let people fill that out if there's no questions thanks Libby. Uh, i guess first of all are there any questions um yeah would people like to either use uh Use the, the phone camera or click on the link and we'll spend maybe kind of about five minutes on the on the survey and then come back see where people are at and and uh, I guess yeah if you have any any questions along the way uh, yeah, raise a hand and thank you again for taking the time to do this this is really informative to us because we, we want to make sure that the events, programs, trainings, uh, whatever we're thinking about helping, um, you know, put together is actually going to be useful to the users. So this is a really important part of uh, the, the process for us. So thanks. So it's 11.22 by me, might check in again at about 11.25 and just see how far people through, uh, uh, through it. Yep, that sounds great.
Hey, Lippy, for those of us who are staff and I guess not allowed to fill out your survey, just wondering what kinds of things you're asking about. Yeah, so we're asking um, a lot of questions about current uh, engagement in the form of um, participating in maybe these meetings, trainings, um, Slack. You you could check it out. You're absolutely welcome to. I think you should be able to click through it because I, I don't think any of the questions are actually required. Um, so you should be able to click through it. Um, otherwise, I can even share it with you in another format. But the idea is, um, yeah, questions about um, the current engagement. Um, we have a, a nurse user Slack. So we want to find out, like, is the Slack useful or helpful to you? Do you use it? Um, if you do use it, how do you use it? Um, and then some questions about um, just to find out who, who is filling out our survey, just so we get a sense of what, who engaged with us even in the survey. Um, and then also some opportunities for people to think about, oh, if this program existed, you know, would I participate? Would I be um, interested in, you know, would, would, would this be interesting to me? Um, and then a place for people to provide um, any of their own ideas as well. Thanks. Yeah. And I did put in the chat my email address if anyone is you know, doesn't like surveys, which is valid, um, but you would, wouldn't mind sharing your, I'm, I am in the nurse user Slack. You can message me, you could email me if you have a thought. Um, you could email anyone that you know is in, at, you know, nurse user, um, in the nurse user space or anyone at nurse and they can forward it on to me. Um, if you have an idea, I'm, I'm open to hearing about it. How are people going with it so far? People through to page two or three yet? Thanks, Gregory. Yeah, I, I agree. I think um, people get survey fatigue and they also, um, have a hard time scheduling it in for their own time. So we thought this would just help people uh, do it. And then we'd have that great data. So thank you. Steve, I think giving people maybe one more minute is um, a good idea. And then I think we should move on. Let's say another, just one minute. Sounds good. We'll give another minute and uh... And I guess if you haven't finished it by then, you can uh, probably keep, keep on going while we go through some um, announcements and calls for participation. Have it half finished in the background. Okay, it's been, uh, it's been probably six or seven minutes now. So uh, hopefully people were able to get uh, most of the way through it and then continue either so yeah, during the meeting or afterwards. And um, thank you all for, uh, for, you know, yeah, for participating and working through that. It's uh, really valuable information.
Um, so we have a handful of announcements and calls for participation. Um, there are some that were announced in a weekly email and you can uh, uh, easily go back and uh, see those and click on the links there. Uh, some that might be of particular interest to people. Uh, if you are a student or have or know students, they, uh, you or they might be interested to know that uh, NERSC has a bunch of summer internships available. So yeah, we're looking for interns for the, for the summer period. Um, yeah, there's a, a list of projects and some more information at this link here. And these slides will go up on the, the web page afterwards as well. But if you go to the, the most recent weekly email, uh, there are items for all of these. There's a couple of CFPs that we know about. There's the AY23 research in quantum information science on Perlmutter. Um, call for participation is now open. Um, a couple of webinars and, and seminars coming up through ECP. So the, the ECP Ideas series uh, has a, a talk on uh, the road to extra, exascale particle accelerator and laser plasma, plasma modeling on March 15. And actually this link to the best practices webinars got uh, also links to their previous webinars. And there's some really interesting content in there. Uh, another event that ECP is doing is a HPC workforce, workforce seminar on strategies for inclusive uh, mentorship. And on kind of a yeah, workforce note, uh, NERSC has got actually quite a few positions open at the moment. And NERSC users often turn into really good NERSC staff. So yeah, we encourage you to take, take a look at this uh, careers page. There's a link to it in the weekly email. And um, yeah, consider joining NERSC as a, as a staff member. Um, another big one that's coming up that's relevant to today's topic is we have some training and office hours around migrating from Cory to Perlmutter. So there's a, a training session, session scheduled for March 10th. There's a page on that on the WWW site. Uh, and we'll have office hours coming up uh, starting next week for kind of several sessions. And just before uh, passing on to Rebecca to talk more about Corey's retirement and that migration. Does anybody else have any announcements or calls for participation that uh, other nurse users might be interested to join or to know about? If not, and if you think of one along the way, yeah, feel free to. Drop a, drop a link in the chat. But we might move on to our topic of the day, which is about uh, Corey's retirement. Uh, so Rebecca is the lead of user engagement at NERSC. Um, Rebecca, do you just want to say next at the appropriate moments and I'll move through the slides? That works for me. Okay, so how about next? Oh, same thing, different day, okay. All right, so everybody's here for this exciting topic about uh, Corey retirement. So I'm going to try to give you all some background information so that you can kind of understand everything that's going on and what our plans are for the retirement of Corey. So first, we're going to talk about uh, the life cycle of a supercomputer. Uh, then we're going to talk about why we're why we are going to retire Corey. Uh, and the Corey retirement schedule. And we're also gonna talk about Perlmutter. So that's, that's sort of our outline. Next slide, please. So this is basically an overview of our, the life cycle of a supercomputer. So the first thing that happens is we design the machine. I'll go into a few more details about this in subsequent slides, but the idea is, we got to actually figure out what we're going to get and how we're going to do it. Um, the next step is to actually build that machine. And that is uh, primarily done by our vendor, but sort of a collaborative approach as well in some ways. And then we're going to test and validate this machine that we built, make sure that it's good and it works and it does all the things that we need it to do. And once we're happy with that, 
then we're going to operate the machine for the rest of its lifetime and we're going to maintain it. So we, you know, as you may have noticed, we take monthly maintenances on our machines to make sure that they're still in tip top shape for, for you all and that they're still working. Um, eventually, at the end of the life cycle, then we start thinking about retiring machines. And so we then retire them and decommission them. And then after the machine is turned off, then it gets recycled. Um, and so again, I'm gonna talk more about all of these phases. But this is the general overview. So Steve, if you'll push it again. Um, that's my one animation in this presentation. So uh, I put the machines at the various different um, places where they are in this progression. So if you look down at the bottom right there, we've got Corey, we're in the operate and maintain, but we're getting to the retire stage on Corey. Um, Perlmutter, we are still test, validate, and we're getting to the operation stage for Perlmutter. Um, and then I put N10, that stands for nurse 10, that, that'll be our 10th machine that we acquire. Uh, we are in the process of designing that one right now, while we're also trying to do all these other things with existing machines. Uh, next slide. So like I said, when we design the machine, it's really a collaborative process between us and our vendor or vendors. So first, NERSC develops requirements for our machine. Um, so we say what, what sort of functionality we need, what kind of power uh, processing power, et cetera. Um, and then vendors, will then, then submit a proposal to us about what they can provide. Uh, and then we look through all these proposals and we select the best proposal for price and value. Now, we think a lot about what, what we're gonna do and how we're gonna design these machines and make sure that they're gonna be something that users are gonna be able to use and that are going to uh, be able to do all of the things that we know users want. Um, so the next step is start, to start building the machine. Um, and so the building of it begins in the vendor's factory. Uh, and so they as actually will assemble the machine and then they'll kind of test it a bit and make sure that it sort of functions. And then they will um, disassemble it and send it to NERSC. And, and so that's what they provide. We, on our side, we provide all of the necessary power, water, cooling, stuff like that for the machines. Now, it, I used to work in Australia and we got a machine and they actually shipped it on an airplane to Sydney. And then they shipped it in a road train. It's a truck with lots of long um, trailers after it, like five trailers. Um, they shipped it on a road train to us in Western Australia. That was a pretty exciting journey. But in our case, I think they mostly just come by truck. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so the testing part, I alluded to this before. Testing actually begins in the factory. So they do some factory tests. And often under normal circumstances, we actually go and we look at the machine while they test it. And we sort of help to make sure that it is at least providing the initial uh, functionality that we would we would expect it to be able to provide in that environment before they bring it to NERSC. So then once they do bring it to NERSC and they reassemble the machine, uh, we test it a lot further. Um, and so we do a lot of hardware, software, network testing, um, and, and we also let friendly users on the machine. So we had, for example, an early science period with Perlmutter where we let everybody on who was participating in our early science program. And they kind of checked out the machine, kind of broke it in and, and they were what we call friendly users. So they understood that maybe everything wasn't working quite properly, but they were there to help us too. Um, now the vendor, I wouldn't want to be a supercomputer vendor because they have to put forth, I mean, millions of dollars for all of the parts in this machine. Uh, and then after we accept the machine, then we pay them for it. So they're, they're fronting a lot of the expense of these machines. I mean, there are some milestones where, where they'll get some partial payments, but the bulk of the payment comes at the end when we accept the machine. And in order for us to accept it, 
we have to pass a lot of tests. So we have functionality testing, performance testing, stability testing, reliability testing. You know, we, we do very thorough testing. And this includes a 30 day stability test where we have all of our users on there just pounding away at the machine and it has to remain in service for a, a very high percentage of the time anyway with users on it during this 30 day period before we can pay them money. All right, next slide. Now we've accepted our machine, it's, it's all going well. Um, when, when we're operating our machine, it's a round the clock operation. So we have staff on site 24 seven, 365 days a year. There's somebody there on Christmas. There's somebody there, uh, you know, at 2 a.m. on a Sunday. You know, every day there's somebody there. Um, and while we're doing that, um, we also are doing a regular maintenance of our machine. So we have actual on-site vendor staff at NERSC um, from HPE, and they perform actual physical maintenance of the machine. So they, if there's a node that's gone bad or something, they'll pull it out and they'll replace it or they'll fix it. Um, they'll replace cables that have gone bad, you know, you name it, anything physical they will, they will do to repair the machine. Um, and then in addition, we do regular upgrades of the system software. For example, there may be security issues that we need to be sure to patch before they become a problem. Um, there may be bugs that are in the software that we also will upgrade or patch in order to fix those problems. And also sometimes we actually get more functionality when we introduce new software onto the machine. All right, next slide. Okay, so let's stop for a second here and talk about reliability. So when we get the machine, there's like this, what we would call a shakeout period where there's faulty new hardware that, you know, somehow wasn't detected or, or things just fail. Um, they tend to find this in system reliability, which is apparently actually an area of study that people study. So that's kind of cool. Um, so there's, they call it an infant mortality failure. I hate to use that term, so I'm not going to say that again. Um, but early on, uh, parts will fail on a machine and also late in its life, parts will fail. Um, and so there's the early failures and then there's the wear out failures. And then there's just also just totally random failures. And during, those, uh, during the uh, lifetime of the machine, it's, this is what's called the bathtub curve. If you look over here, there is a curve of, of the failure rates. And um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, and so you can see it's kind of higher at the beginning and then it kind of slopes down and it's pretty flat through the middle. And then it comes back up at the end. Um, and so in the middle period, you know, the middle age of the computer, it, it has a pretty low constant uh, failure rate. But then as, as the time goes on, we start to get more of these wear out failures. Uh, and, and so the failure rate goes up again. All right, next slide. Okay, so we retire our machines at the end of their useful life, because after a certain point, as you've seen, like the bathtub curve there, uh, failure rates really begin to rise and machines become a lot harder to support and much less reliable. So um, another reason is that as new technologies come out, they tend to be more energy efficient and provide more compute power for the same amount of, of uh, energy. So that's another good reason that we like to get a new machine. Um, so once we retire the machine, then we actually, we return it to the vendor. That's how we do it. Um, and what they do with the machine is they recycle it in some way. So sometimes they resell it. So for example, my understanding is that there's a part of Edison that is um, in Texas now having a second life. Um, others, other parts of it, they will use it for spare parts for similar models that are still in operation. And then if they can't do either of those things, then they will just take out all of like the valuable metals or other components and they'll remove those and they'll recycle uh, the, the valuable metals and things like that from the machine. 
All right, next slide. So why do we need to retire Cori? Well, Cori has reached the end of its useful lifespan. So you know how dog years, like there's seven dog years to one human year. So I think there may be like 12 supercomputer years to one human year. So about the age, about one year amount. So Cori is in its 80s, 90s, maybe even 100 years old. Um, and so it's really not, it's really reached sort of the end of the expected lifespan of a supercomputer. Um, this model of supercomputer is no longer being produced. Um, so that means that, of course, the processors haven't been produced for years, the memory also, um, but there's also other components like the cabinet components, like fans, electrical parts, those were all custom made for this machine. And those are no longer manufactured. So if something fails, we have to rely on remanufactured replacement parts, assuming that we can even find them. Um, so we also have observed more frequent failures in the, in the individual components of the machine. I mean, um, it may not be as visible to you all, but occasionally, lately, we've been having whole cabinets going down because of the uh, rectifier in them. It's an electrical uh, part. I don't exactly know what it does, but the, the uh, rectifier has been going down and, um, and then we have to replace that. Um, and so that's very disruptive to users. So uh, that's, that's, that's another reason uh, why the, the reliability is going down. Um, and then also failures subsequent from now um, are becoming more and more difficult to recover from um, because we don't have parts that we can actually put in the machine, we've run out. Um, of particular concern to us is the scratch system. There are no spare parts available for the scratch system. So if something fails in the scratch system, uh, we could lose user data. So we've already told you all that. It shouldn't be a surprise to you. And any and in order to recover from that, we may end up repurposing internally parts of the machine. Um, so it's, um, if something fails, then we just may end up having to shrink the machine because we can't we don't have that part anymore. And so we just have to shrink everything down. And we may shrink it even more so that we can have a spare part. It just kind of depends on what happens. And also recoveries may take longer than they would normally because again, we don't have replacement parts. We just have these refurbished parts that are very limited. And where we don't have refurbished parts, then we have to kind of figure out what to do and try to make do with everything that we have. All right, next slide, please. So here is our current plan for retiring Corey. So um, on March 31st, we're going to remove all of the auxiliary components from Cori. So large memory nodes, um, those are um, nodes that we acquired in, I guess, 2020 um, that have a large memory on them. Those are still very useful and they still exist. Um, those parts still exist. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that and we're going to migrate it over to Perlmutter. So then the large memory nodes will be on Perlmutter and you'll be able to use them. It won't be a, a fast process, but, but um, that's our plan for those. Um, and then there's also a GPU partition on Cori, just a very small partition of, of GPUs um, that we also, we acquired those probably five years ago or more. Um, and those nodes are gonna just be retired because those have obsolete GPUs that aren't as good as the GPUs that we have in Perlmutter. So we don't need to keep those at all. So that part, we're just gonna retire. Um, so then at the end of the at the end of April, we're gonna retire Corey as a whole. And let's call that date T, okay? Um, we will let you have access to the scratch system for another week after T. Um, but then after that, we'll power down the machine altogether. And then the next month, we will start to remove Corey from the machine room. Next slide, please. So let's talk about Perlmutter because that's kind of the elephant in the room for everyone. Um, so 
We haven't yet completed the testing of our final configuration of Perlmutter. So Perlmutter has 14 GPU cabinets, 12 CPU cabinets, and the network is Slingshot 11. That's what SS11 stands for. We, we have finally reached that configuration earlier this month. Um, I'm not sure when we're gonna be able to start testing this file configuration, but it's gonna happen soon. Now, we are not gonna retire Corey until Perlmutter is thoroughly tested and working for users. So I mentioned before about testing. So we've already done some testing, like the functionality, like the system provides a lot of basic functionalities. Check, we can check that box. Um, performance, we were able to achieve certain performance levels on certain benchmarks, so we can check that box. The two that are really remaining right now are the stability and the reliability. So the system needs to remain up during our testing period. I told you there's this 30 day window where it needs to basically remain up. And then reliability, we need to have fewer hardware and software failures than what we're seeing right now. The next slide. So we know that Perlmutter is not meeting our expectations and it's not meeting yours either yet. And we understand how important it is that Perlmutter is a reliable machine in order for you all to continue to make scientific progress. So we meet with HPE, that's our vendor. We meet with them every day to address bugs and issues. Um, right now, we have some HPE experts at NERSC today, this week, to focus on resolving these issues that we are all experiencing. And we're optimistic that this collaboration will improve Perlmutter's reliability. Next slide. So we're working together with HPE to address the stability of the Slingshot network. We know that's not, not working right yet. The IO performance on Perlmutter's scratch system and on our community file system, those are also not working well. And um, the node hardware reliability, we also have seen some issues there. Um, and in this collaboration, we have developed some new processes so we've developed some new methods to uh, like have a methodical process, I guess, for fixing nodes that we find to be problematic before returning them to service. Um, so there's a certain procedure that they go through to make sure that uh, the node problems truly have been fixed before they return them to service. Um, we've made some configuration changes to the community file system and to the CFS client on Perlmutter um, in order to stabilize the network communication and performance. Some of those things seem to be panning out for us. So, so that's good too. And then we're also rolling out some fixes to some slingshot network bugs that we discovered and HPE has also discovered and um, things that, that they have been able to fix. So we're rolling those out this week and next week. And um, we're confident that those will make a big difference in the performance of the machine. Now, of course, there could be additional um, issues that we have not yet detected or haven't figured out the cause of, um, but we're gonna continue to work really hard on this and it has our utmost attention because we know that as it stands today, the machine is not meeting anyone's expectations. Next slide, please. So in summary, in the supercomputer lifestyle, lifestyle, life cycle, <laughs> Corey has reached the end. Uh, there's no new parts being manufactured or it. it makes the upkeep especially challenging. We plan to retire Corey at the end of April. Uh, Perlmutter reliability issues are being addressed at top priority by us and our vendor HPE. And that is all I have. At this time, I'm happy to answer any questions.